Hey guys, we're in the beginning of Luke and I'm going to read the intro from the Passion Translation and sorry I haven't read in a couple days. It's been a few stressful days but um, things are getting better. Okay, so let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, may your blessings of peace and love and happiness be upon everyone who watches these videos. And please help us understand the wisdom and knowledge that we retain today, Lord. And Lord, please bless and help my brother and sister, Whitney and Alex. They're so strong and intelligent and loving and help them, Lord, in whatever they do. <clears throat> Lord, thank you for all the people that you um, bless us with in our lives. Help us be your shining light to them, Lord. Help us show them love, just like you show your love to us. And Jesus, please help Liz from church. Um, please help her stop fainting during her pregnancy, Lord. And please protect her and the baby and let everything go smoothly from here on out. <clears throat> and Lord, I'm just so grateful, <clears throat> sorry, that you chose me and that um, you called me to be your disciple, Lord. Thank you for blessing all of us as your chosen ones, Jesus. Thank you that um, by your blood, we are healed and forgiven because we believe in you, Lord. You're just so amazing and loving and gracious and can't ever seem to get over it, Lord. And we love you so very much, Jesus. And thank you for everything you do for us. And Lord, we pray and ask these things in your name, Jesus. So be it. Okay, so this is the Passion Translation intro for Luke. <clears throat> I don't know what's wrong with my voice, sorry. <clears throat> okay, at a glance, author, Luke, beloved physician, friend, and companion to Paul, audience, Theophilus, and all lovers of God. Date, late 80s, 60s, though possibly 70 to 85. Type of literature, ancient historical biography, major themes, Jesus' person, Jesus' works, the kingdom realm, the Christian life, social, social dimensions, and the Holy Spirit. And, okay, about Luke. You're about to read the biography of the wonderful man, Jesus Christ. The glorious gospel was penned by one of his early followers, a physician named Luke. All four gospels in our New Testament are inspired by God, but Luke's is unique. I believe that this could be described as the loveliest book ever written. I think Psalms is. <laughs> Just my opinion. Luke's pen was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And, okay, every book in the Bible, every chapter, every verse is inspired by God and the Holy Spirit. Okay, <clears throat> Luke's pen was anointed by the Holy Spirit and his book is still read today by the lovers of God because it is the mercy gospel. It's a book for everybody, for we all need mercy. Luke writes clearly, of the humanity of Jesus as the servant of all and the sacrifice for all. Every barrier is broken down in Luke's gospel between Jew and Gentile, men and women, rich and poor. In Luke, we see Jesus as the savior of all who come to him. Luke, being a physician, learned the need to exhibit compassion and mercy towards others. 
It comes through in every chapter. Luke's gospel is perhaps the most compassionate and love-filled account of Jesus' life ever written. Luke shares Jesus' teachings on prayer, forgiveness, and our obligation to demonstrate mercy and grace in dealings with others. Luke provides us with rich details of Jesus' love of children and the forsaken. Luke writes about Jesus' ministry to women 24 times. This was somewhat controversial in the day, in the culture of his day. In fact, Luke uses an alternating narrative of one story about a man and the next story about a woman. Luke begins with the story of Zechariah, then moves to Mary, a focus on Simeon, then on Anna, the Roman centurion, then the widow of Nain, the good Samaritan, then Mary and Martha. This pattern continues throughout his gospel. A large amount of Luke's gospel is not found in any other gospel narrative. If we didn't have the book of Luke, we wouldn't know about the stories of the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, the wedding banquet, the wedding banquet, and other amazing teachings. Only in the book of Luke do we find the stories of the shepherds at Bethlehem, the ten lepers who were healed, the young man from Nain who was raised from the dead, and the dying thief on the cross next to Jesus. How thankful I am for the gospel of Luke. My heart over, this is the author, the Passion Translation author. My heart overflows with the joy of seeing the word of God being translated with all its passions and fire into contemporary English. Unveiled before your eyes will be the glorious man, Jesus Christ, and the revelation of his undying love for you. Okay, purpose. This world is a far better place because of the revelation Luke shares with us in his gospel. He gives us a full picture of Jesus' life and ministry, applying scrupulous accuracy to all he wrote to ensure that what he read is factual. In fact, Luke uses the Greek word for autopsy for investigating with firsthand knowledge those who had seen what Jesus did and heard what Jesus taught. Dr. Luke, oh, he called him Dr. Luke, that's cute. Dr. Luke performed an autopsy on the facts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. It's kind of like, <clears throat> Luke's gospel is kind of like, uh, from the viewpoint of an um, investigator or scientist or researcher. Okay. So Dr. Luke performed an autopsy on the facts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, tracing them all, all back to their source to make sure what he compiled was of the highest degree of accuracy. He, te he takes Theophilus through Jesus' entire ministry career to reveal how God worked to show Jesus to be true and the hope of the world. He also shows how God has been faithful to Israel and the promises he's given her while inviting the nations to the table of Christ's love and hope. Okay, author and audience. We know little about Luke, the human author of this gospel. He was a companion of the Apostle Paul for some of his missionary journeys and was possibly one of Paul's early converts. Luke was a literary genius and writes with powerful prose. Some believe Luke... Some believe Luke was possibly the only non-Jewish writer of the New Testament. Others believe that he was a Syrian Jew who took upon himself a Gentile name. It's obvious that he knew firsthand many of the early followers of Jesus, even the apostles who were chosen to preach his name throughout the nations. Near the end of the Apostle Paul's life, when he was facing martyrdom, Paul, Paul wrote of his trusted friend, only Luke. Is with me. Luke was mentored by the Apostle Paul. This can be seen by Luke's vocabulary in his gospel. There are 200 expressions or phrases that are similar in Paul's and Luke's writings. The opening line of the gospel indicates Luke wrote to the most excellent Theophilus. The name Theophilus means friend of God or lover of God. The Greek word means most honorable or mightiest. Some scholars suggest there was no individual name Theophilus mentioned in Luke's writings. Regardless, Luke's gospel is a greeting to all the lovers of God. 
He especially wrote it to non-Jewish lovers of God who may have felt out of place in the originally Jewish movement. Okay, major themes. The person and work of Jesus. Dang, this is a long intro. As you can imagine, a historical biography of Jesus will feature him and his work front and center. In Luke's gospel, he is the sent one who is both Lord and Messiah. He's uniquely and intimately connected to God, transcending any portrait of him as simply a human figure and agent. He's also the one who acts as the promised Messiah, anointed by the Spirit to bring in the new era. God's heavenly kingdom realm to earth. His ultimate act was on behalf of every person on the planet bearing the sins of the world as he hung on the Roman cross. And in the end, this Lord Messiah was vindicated by the Father through the resurrection and exalted to his right hand through the ascension. Okay. <clears throat> the promised kingdom realm. In Jesus Christ, all of God's promises are fulfilled. Chief among them is God's promised kingdom realm. God's kingdom realm is both present and coming. Jesus commands his disciples to proclaim that it has come near and is within people's reach in the present. The promises of the last days have started to be fulfilled, and yet those promises haven't been ultimately fulfilled. The full manifestation of the kingdom realm is still anticipated when all the hoped-for prophecies of restoration will be realized. Okay, next theme, women and the poor. Women are a crucial part of Jesus' story, now and then. In Luke's gospel, they provide examples of deep piety and devotion. They are both of humble means and wealthy. At every turn, women are part of Jesus' ministry, Elizabeth, Anna, and of course Mary play important roles in his infancy. Women are healed, comforted, and forgiven in Galilee. On the way to Jerusalem, we meet Mary and Martha. And during Christ's most desperate hours, women weep at his feet, stand with him faithfully. Finally, they receive the first revelation of Jesus' resurrection when Mary and Martha were at his, were at his tomb. Okay, then there are the poor. Throughout Luke, the poor receive special attention too, showing that God deliberately reaches out to those whom society casts away. He makes clear the good news of Jesus and his love for people like them, which means the gospel truly is for everybody. Okay, the next theme is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit plays a major role in Luke's gospel where he is referenced nearly 20 times. The Spirit is the driving force in the picture Luke paints of God's coming salvation. He is the architect, the maestro guiding and energizing the events that transpire throughout the life of Jesus. We find him present from the very beginning with his conception and birth on to Christ's baptism in the Spirit and through to his faithful power, his, mir his powerful miracle ministry. One of the most important texts in all the Gospels is Luke 3, 5, 15 through 16, where John says, One might, John the Baptist, one mightier than he would come baptizing with the spirit of holiness and fire. The spirit of fire is the sign and seal of the new era or covenant of the Messiah, come to rescue and recreate the world. Luke, to the lovers of God. Okay. Chapter 1. Oh, we might only get through chapter 1 today. Okay, Luke 1. <clears throat> I am writing for you, mighty lover of God, an orderly account of what Jesus accomplished and fulfilled among us. Several eyewitness biographies have already been written, using as their source material the good news preached among us by his early disciples who were from the beginning loving servants of the living expression or word, the Bible, just in case. Now I'm passing on to you this accurate compilation of my own meticulous investigation based on numerous eyewitness interviews. It's appropriate for me to write this, for he also appeared to me, 
so that I would reassure you beyond any shadow of a doubt the re reliability of all you have been taught of him. Okay, angelic prophecy of the prophet John's birth. Verse 5, during the reign of King Herod the Great of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah who served in the temple as part of the priestly order of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also from a family of priests and was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous before God, living virtuously and following the commandments of the Lord blamelessly. But they were childless since Elizabeth was barren, and now they both were quite old. Okay, so this is Zechariah and Elizabeth who are quite old. And Elizabeth and Mary, are Jesus' mother, are related. But I'm pretty sure it talks about it right here. Okay. One day, Zechariah's priestly order was on duty, and he was serving as priest. He was chosen by the casting of lots. So the honor fell upon Zechariah to enter the holy place and burn incense before the Lord. A large crowd of worshipers had gathered to pray outside the temple at the hour when incense was being offered. All at once, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing just to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was startled and overwhelmed with fear, but the angel reassured him, saying, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God is showing grace to you, for I have come to tell you that your prayer for a child has been answered. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to name him John. Okay, so Zechariah and Elizabeth are the Mary of John, or the mother of John the Baptizer. Okay, verse 14, his birth will bring you much joy and gladness. Many will rejoice because of him, and he will be one of the great ones in the sight of God. He will drink no wine or strong drink, but he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even while still in his mother's womb. Oh, what? That's crazy. And he will persuade many in Israel to convert and turn back to the Lord their God. He will go before the Lord as a forerunner with the same power and anointing as Elijah the prophet. He will be instrumental. So this is why Jesus says, I think we already read in uh, Matthew or Mark or both, like Elijah comes before Jesus to prepare the way. And so John the Baptist is compared to Elijah. So. He will be instrumental in turning the hearts of the fathers in tenderness back to their children and the hearts of the disobedient back to the wisdom of their righteous fathers. And he will prepare a united people who are ready for the Lord's appearing. Zechariah asked the angel, how do you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man and my wife is too old to give me a child. What sign can you give me to prove this will happen? Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. Can you believe Gabriel talked to him? Oh, the name Gabriel means God's hero or God's mighty one. <clears throat> okay, so then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand beside God himself. He has sent me to announce to you this good news. But now, since you did not believe my words, you will be stricken silent and unable to speak until the day my words have been fulfilled at their appointed time and a child is born to you. That will be your sign. So Gabriel made a mute until John was born. Meanwhile, the crowds outside kept expecting him to come out. They were amazed over Zechariah's delay, wondering what could have happened inside the sanctuary. When he finally did come out, he tried to talk, but he couldn't speak a word, and they realized from his gestures that he had seen a vision while in the holy place. He remained mute as he finished his days of priestly ministry in the temple and then went back to his home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went in, into seclusion for the next five months. 
With joy, she exclaimed, See how kind it is of God to gaze upon me and take away the disgrace of my barrenness. Okay, angelic prophecy of Jesus' birth. During the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Rejoice, beloved young woman, for the Lord is with you and you are anointed with great favor. Okay, Mary was deeply trou troubled over the words of the angel and be bewildered over what this may mean for her. But the angel reassured her, saying, Do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. You will become pregnant with a baby boy, and you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will enthrone him as king on the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Mary said, But how could this happen? I'm still a virgin. Gabriel answered, The spirit of holiness will fall upon you, and Almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. This is why the child born to you will be holy and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your aged aunt, Elizabeth, has also become pregnant with a son. The barren one, oh, so he's, he's calling Elizabeth the barren one. She's now in her sixth month of pregnancy. Not one promise from God is empty of power. Nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary responded saying, "Yes, I will be mother. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. May everything you have told me come to pass." And the angel left her. Elizabeth's prophecy to Mary. Afterward, Mary arose and hurried off to the hill country of Judea, to the village where Zechariah and Elizabeth lived. Arriving at their home, Mary entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the moment, her aunt heard Mary's voice. The baby within Elizabeth's womb jumped and kicked. Oh! And suddenly, Elizabeth was filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she prophesied with power. Mary, you are a woman given the highest favor and privilege above all others. For your child is destined to bring God great delight delight. How did I deserve such a remarkable honor to have the mother of my Lord come and visit me? The moment you came in the door and greeted me, my baby danced inside me with joy. Great favor rests upon you, for you have believed every word spoken to you from the Lord. Mary's prophetic song. And then Mary sang this song, my soul is ecstatic, overflowing with praises to God. My spirit bursts with joy over my life-giving God. For he sent his tender gaze upon me, his lowly servant girl. And from here on, everyone will know that I have been favored and blessed. The mighty one has worked a mighty miracle for me. Holy is his name. Mercy kisses all who fear him from one generation to the next. Mighty power flows from him to scatter all those who walk in pride. Powerful princes he tears from their thrones and he lifts up the lowly to take their place. Those who hunger for him will always be filled, but the smug and self-satisfied he will send away empty. Because he can never forget to show mercy, he has helped his chosen servant Israel, keeping his promises to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Before going home, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. This is not so cool. I just love it. Okay, the birth of the prophet John. When Elizabeth's pregnancy was full term, she gave birth to a son. 
All her family, friends, and neighbors heard about it, and they too were overjoyed, for they realized that the Lord had showered his wonderful mercy upon her. When the baby was eight days old, according to their custom, all the family and friends came together for the circumcision ceremony. Everyone assumed that the parents would name the baby Zechariah after his father. But Elizabeth spoke up and said, no, his name is John. What? They explained. No one in your family line has that name. So they gestured to the baby's father to ask what to name the child. And Zechariah is still mute at this point. Oh, so he motioned for a writing tablet and to the amazement, to the amazement of all, he wrote, his name is John. Oh, John means God's gift or God is gracious. Instantly, Zechariah could speak again, and his first words were praises to the Lord. The fear of God fell on the people of their village, and the news of this astounding event traveled throughout the hill country of Judea. Everyone was in awe over it. All who heard this news were astonished and wondered. Since a miracle brought his birth, what on earth will this child become? Clearly, God's presence is, a, presence is upon this child in a powerful way. Zechariah's prophecy. Then Zechariah was filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, and he prophesied, saying, Praise be to the exalted Lord God of Israel, for he has seen us through eyes of grace, and he comes as our hero God to set us free. He appears to us as a mighty savior, a trumpet of redemption from the house of David, his servant, just as he promised long ago by the words of his holy prophets. They prophesied he would come one day and save us from every one of our enemies and from the power of those who hate us. Now he has shown us the mercy promised to our ancestors, for he has remembered his holy covenant. He has rescued us from the power of our enemies, fulfilling the sacred oath he made with our father Abraham. Now we can boldly worship God with holy lives, living in purity as priests in his presence every day. And to you I prophesy, my little son, you will be known as the prophet of the Most High. You will be a forerunner going before the face of Lord Yahweh to prepare hearts to embrace his ways. You will preach to his people the revelation of salvation, the cancellation of all our sins to bring us back to God. The splendor light of heaven's glorious sunrise is about to break upon us in holy visitation, all because the merciful heart of our God is so very tender. The word from heaven will come to us with dazzling light to shine upon those who live in darkness near death's dark shadow and he will illuminate the path that leads to the way of peace. Afterward, their son grew up and was strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and he grew in his love for God. John chose to live in the lonely wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. I do love Luke and John. They're my favorites. No Psalmses. <laughs> okay, let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for being the God of mercy and love and grace that we do not deserve. We are in awe of you, Lord, and we give you all the glory and praise and honor. And Lord, we exalt you and lift you on high. We bow before you in awe, Lord, and in reverence. Not only are you good to us, but you are great to us and you give us everything we ask for and you're always blessing us and thank you, Lord, that your love is unconditional with no strings attached and I'm just in unbelief of your gloriousness. I just, I just thank you, Lord, and I love you so much. And thank you for letting your word pass through from generation to generation. And thank you that 
Your words never fail and never lose strength and power, just like you, Lord. And we love you so much, and we thank you, and we pray and ask these things in your name, Jesus. So be it. Okay, God bless. I love you guys.